I'm glad to see you guys here. I know the pub crawls at 5.30, so I appreciate the sacrifice you've made uh, to be here and talk about serverless architectures and miss the pub, <laughs> pub crawl. Um, I've got a good uh, session for you today. Three speakers. I'm Michael Connor, and uh, I work for Coca-Cola North America, and I'm leading our, clouds, our um, enterprise cloud migration. And I'm going to talk about a few things. Uh, one, how serverless affects productivity. And, um, and also, I want to go over a case study on vending that we've done and present a cost comparison with the IAS. I mean, the most important thing for me that I want to leave you guys with is uh, all the information you need to take back to your organization so that you can um, share this data with executives, uh, get them to support you, and then um, and perhaps get funding and move forward with a significant serverless effort next year. Uh, second on stage, uh, Andrew Baird from Amazon Web Services is going to be going over uh, serverless uh, practices, best practice for the enterprise. And then rounding it out is our very own Patrick Brandt, also from Coca-Cola. Uh, and he's going to talk about the serverless adoption rollout, rollout strategy. Um, so before we get into the details, um, uh, I just want to talk about ser serverless and a culmination of computing for 3,500 years. We like to think of computing as being a relatively modern phenomenon. But if you, you look back, developers and makers have always been there throughout history. And so uh, the device you see here on the screen, this is called the Antikythera mechanism. And it was discovered in a shipwreck off the Greek island of Antikythera in 1901. And this is actually a device that scientists date back to 150 BC. And it's a mechanical analog computer. It's comprised of about 30 bronze uh, mesh metal gears. And it's used to predict calendrical events. So with this, they could predict eclipses and the position of the planets and, um, and the moon. It was a very powerful, brilliant design. And I think like a lot of brilliant designs, the inspiration for this probably came in moments. But because of the physical aspects of this design, it probably took years, decades, I don't, I don't really know, maybe a lifetime to actually build this. And this is the dilemma that makers have faced throughout history, right? Our, our minds have been throttled by the physical aspects of our design. So I think uh, for the first time in history, serverless gives us the ability to bring ideas to life as quickly as we can imagine them. I think it's an, it's an exciting time to be, to be in computing. So um, I've got to ask, why do we do this? Like, as technologists and developers, why do we show up every day and do what we do? I think, um, I think maybe some people you know, would, would say, uh, the money's pretty good. But um, I don't think most of us are obsessed with being in the three comma club or you know, with, with cars, uh, having cars with doors that go like this. It's, I, think it's, I think developers do it because they want to make a difference and they want to be powerful. And um, Werner Vogel talked about this, and Andy Jassy talked about this, about Amazon giving us superpowers. And I think that's what draws developers into this. Computing is a force multiplier. It can feel a lot like superpowers, incredible stuff that we can do. And so I think a lot of us are drawn in by the empowerment. And we want to do cool stuff in our organization. And, um, and, but sometimes I think the reality that we face on a daily basis is at odds uh, with, the, with the dream. We're, we're, doing, we're spending a lot of time doing uh, networking issues, SWAT calls. We're spending time uh, fighting the help desk. And we're doing a lot of the stuff that Werner Vogels calls uh, undifferentiated heavy lifting. And so um, I think that's where some of the disillusionment sets in within IT. Uh, if you guys have read the, the book, The Phoenix Project, this will seem familiar to you. All of the work that we do in IT can be categorized into one of these, one of these four categories. And also, um, I've, I've put under each one of these an estimate on where our group is spending our time uh, before we've gotten into some of the more modern uh, concepts like um, operational intelligence, and serverless. So if you look at this, and I think this is, I think that this is not too different for a lot of organizations, but time spent in business projects, this is the only time that your organization deems as valuable and adding valuable to the business. Everything else is stuff that we do in IT, but it's really not seen as, as adding value. And so 39%, for us to only spend 39% of our time in IT, we can do a lot better, right? And, and we're getting questions from the business like, why is this so expensive, and why is this taking so long? And it's because so little of our time is actually going to delivering business projects for them. Right? And, and also, I think increasingly, IT organizations, we're, we're competing with shadow IT. We're competing with external uh, MSP and, and other vendors. And we're getting dragged down by this legacy stuff. And so I want to pay close attention to the unplanned work. This is 24% 24, 24 of our time was spent in unplanned work. So I, I think this is familiar to all you guys. right? We're, we're spending our nights, our weekends, our holidays. And this is time away from our friends and our families and the people we care about. And so uh, I think this is a quality of, quality of life issue in, in a lot of IT departments. 
And so I think this is something that serverless is gonna help us address. Um, this is actually, we did a, a spot, a 30 second spot for the Super Bowl with Ant-Man and uh, Incredible Hulk. So I use these as backgrounds. The um, Ant-Man stole Incredible Hulk's Coke and ha had to suffer his wrath. But um, so who are the villains in the story? Who's taking all of our time? This is a talk about serverless, so we've got to do some obligatory server bashing. It's, it's servers, but it's, it's not just virtual servers, it's physical, ser it's physical servers, but it's also virtual servers. So, you know, we went to Amazon, we had this initial rush of like, wow, I can spin up a server in minutes, and it used to take weeks. But then that initial rush fades off when you realize that the cost, the cost of maintaining and babysitting server over its lifetime, doing stuff like patching, monitoring, management, upgrading licensing, dealing with underutilization, overutilization, those things cost a lot of money. I mean, uh, we've got a mainframe that's been on uh, running for, for 20 years. We've got you know, a couple Windows 2003 machines that are, you know, that are stragglers. And so um, all of this, this work it makes that initial spin up seem, seem pretty minor if you think about it. And there's another more subtle, subtle villain in the story, and that's like legacy processes and, and um, IT tradition. So, so the problem with servers in the cloud, the virtual servers is they feel a lot like physical servers. So the initial instinct for, for a lot of enterprises is, well, and actually, if you, if you go online with a, a virtual server, it looks and feels just like a physical server, right? And so we start to think of it as, um, we start to apply the same practices. We join them to AD, uh, we join them into our 10 dot addresses and, and into our WAN, we secure them the same way. And so all of a sudden, we're starting to get, we're just moving our dad's data center into the cloud. And so a lot of this initial rust and excitement and the promise that we made um, to our business um, for what the cloud could bring us, a lot of that starts to, um, starts to fall flat. And so, um, so I think serverless is actually gonna help us change that culture. A lot of people when I talk about this, they say, well, DevOps is gonna save the day, right? And I, I totally disagree. This is, this is one of those buzzwords that everyone is kind of using today, right? So um, unless operations are simplified, this is gonna be a disaster. It, it, so think about what we're asking developers to do with DevOps. They're already coming to work, they're coding, writing unit tests, doing deployment. They're doing all this work, and now we're going to ask them to take on ops as well. And um, developers, I think developers are misunderstood. Developers are not good at, at, um, at patching, monitoring, um, building TPS reports, and all, all that kind of more minutia that the uh, ops teams are better at. The best developers I've, I've worked with in my life, as a rule, they're, they're poets, they're musicians, they're artists, they're creative people. And so if we're asking developers to do this ops work, we're gonna lose those best people. Or you can see, um, when you log into a Linux box, it always shows you your security status. This is, <laughs> this is what it looks like when you ask the developers to do DevOps, right? 18 security patches needed for this machine. So um, the only way to make DevOps work is to move towards things like serverless where the amount of ops that we're doing is drastically reduced, right? Amazon is taking on the burden of a lot of the ops work that we're doing, and so then the developers are willing to stomach that. And, this, and the last thing I'll say about DevOps is that in order for DevOps to work, we have to make infrastructure, because we're asking developers to take on infrastructure, right? So we have to make infrastructure feel a lot like code, and it needs to feel familiar to developers. And so if you're going into the Amazon console right now and you're spinning up servers and you're clicking things and you're, you're doing things manually, it's, it's not gonna be a scalable approach. And so I think the way to do it and the way that we've, we've approached it is infrastructure is code, everything gets pushed into um, we call it ter uh, Terraform or CloudFormation. But all of that gets checked into Git, it gets versioned, it gets managed, and it gets pushed into a CI CD pipeline, like Go or Jenkins. And so um, I think serverless is a, is a great enabler uh, for DevOps. Um, once we kind of move to these things, we're moving to serverless and Amazon is taking on a lot of the heavy lifting, we're starting to see a huge change in productivity in the organization. So if you look at this, 68%, I think that there's still room for improvement here, right? But if all of a sudden, you know, we're going from uh, like 39% to 68%, that's almost a two-fold increase in, um, in our productivity. And that's a huge difference for the organization for, and for the business. And um, the other thing is the unplanned work, down to 6%. That's, that's an incredible shift. And Splunk and operational intelligence has been a, a big factor for that too. But that means we're getting our nights and weekends and we're getting a lot of our sanity back, right? Um, I want to present a serverless case study, um, something that we did. You know, we talked to executives and we talked to them about virtualization in the cloud and hypervisors. And to put it bluntly, they, they really, they don't care. Um, they care about four things. They care about stability, agility, cost effectiveness, and security. And they don't really care about the details of how we get there. 
but that's what's important to them. And so when we looked at doing this, uh, implementing this use case with vending and with our loyalty program, and we did the analysis between traditional IIS and serverless, it was clear that serverless was a really good fit for this. So let me break down how, how this basically works. When you go up and you get a deliver, delicious beverage here, and you swipe your, your credit card and your loyalty card, the transaction goes from the vending machine to our payment gateway, and then that's a partner of ours. The payment gateway then submits a REST API call into the Amazon API gateway. So Amazon API gateway is a serverless API framework um, where Amazon manages all the security and all the patching for you. The Amazon API gateway then takes that transaction and submits it over to, uh, to Lambda, and Lambda's gonna handle all of our business logic. So it's gonna handle transactions, it'll handle um, credits and debits, and um, all, the other, all the other business logic that we wanna implement. And so of course, uh, when the users are doing this with, with their device, we wanna push that information back to their device, right, and so that they have a, an updated balance. So Lambda can then submit that data out, out to uh, Apple Android push notifications, and then they in turn submit that back to Apple Pay or Android Pay. And so in, their, in your wallet, you can see your updated balances. And then we do a, a, a buy 10, get one free, and we have different uh, promotions that we do. So all of this, all of this happens, and um, if you think about all that this goes through, all that happens in under a second. And Amazon is currently charging us, I calculated, about one one thousandth of a penny. And so we're only getting paid if someone's, if someone's actually implementing a transaction. Outside of that, we pay absolutely zero. Uh, I wanted to go through some of the, the cost analysis of service because I want people to, to really fully understand how much we're spending for servers. I think a lot of people aren't really clear on, on really what our to fully burdened cost is. So if you ask someone, hey, what's the cost of a T2 medium server? They're going to go out to Amazon's EC2 page, you look it up, and they'll say $56. That's, I blended a bunch of operating systems, Red Hat, Windows, and, and free Amazon Linux to come up with that number. But if you look at it, the actual cost is, is almost five times that. And so the management cost. This is your internal teams. Uh, this is an MSP. Whoever you're going to pay to do management, patching, um, get on calls if there's servers are slow, spin things down, handle the accounting and stuff for you. Whether it's internal or external, that's probably going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 a month. We're kind of averaging here. Security software, you're going to probably handle antivirus, uh, malware, whatever secu your security teams um, are recommending. And then finally, you're going to probably have some automation server there, Puppet, Chef, Ansible. Um, with some support agreements there. In our Windows 2003 machines, um, I think right now those are end of life support. We're paying $1,000 a quarter for every min Windows 2003 machine um, until, we f until we get rid of those. So, and I think all of the different security issues, there's so many other costs that are not even considered here that um, when you look at this being four or five times amount, I think this actually could balloon to 10 times amount for the, the physical device you're paying at Amazon for your fully bur burdened cost uh, in the cloud. So when we did our use case with vending, we wanted to, uh, you have to do a cost comparison, right? And, um, and I think this is a good place to start with the executives, right? I think we're all enamored with the technology, but when you go back and you propose a use case for your business, you want to go back and say like, hey, is this going to work out for us financially? So what we did was our typical stacks, we're going to have EC2, we use Elastic Beanstalk a lot, we'll have a test cluster, a, um, a staging cluster, and a production cluster, we'll have Elastic Load Balancers, I put the fu fully burdened costs in there, and basically, with those six T2 medium servers, which are not super beefy servers, so I was trying to be conservative here, um, that's gonna come in at like a little under 13,000 a year. And so doing the same thing for our vending systems um, that we implemented, we were getting about 30 million calls a month. It's not a huge amount, um, but that's a decent amount for us. And, um, and this is coming in at 4,500, um, 4,500 a year. So if you look at that, that's a 65% cost savings at 30 million hits per month. And so there is a break-even point. If you're running huge numbers of transactions, um, there's a point where you're gonna start to run um, containers or you're gonna run EC2 machines and it's, start, it's gonna start looking more attractive to just run your own boxes. For us, the analysis I did, it came out to about 80 million hits per month before it starts to even look attractive to go to, um, to infrastructure as a service. Here's the interesting thing you don't really think about. All of these systems have like a long tail life cycle, right? So our first vending machines that we pushed out, there's 10 of those. Well, in the case of the infrastructure as a service, you still have those six, those three clusters in the six machines, right? And what about the end of life? When we have our last 10 machines that we haven't quite sunset yet, what about that? We'd still be paying 13,000 a year um, in infrastructure as a service. But, the, but serverless really handles the long tail scenarios really well. When we get down to um, under a, a million hits per month, 
we're now at a 99% cost savings. And so this really ramps down elegantly. And, and most systems are like that. Like how many systems do you guys have that are, that are running with 30 million, 80 million hits a month? A lot of our systems are doing low transactions, but you're still paying that 13,000 a year. And so um, I think the cost, cost is very compelling unless you're running huge volumes. So we're, um, as you can tell, we're all sold on, on serverless. And in, in a, as a matter of fact, when you bring a solution through our architecture review board, we actually ask that you use uh, serverless. It's, it's mandated. And so serverless doesn't work for everything. We've got package applications, off-the-shelf stuff, commercial, um, off-the-shelf packages. And a lot of those are not going to work with Lambda. This is not going to be some panacea where it just solves all of your problems, right? But, um, and so in those cases, we get an exception, and people are using EC2 instances or, or the other things like that. But the assumption is that you're going to use um, serverless or justify the reasons why you won't. Um, and again, back to Werner, something that uh, Werner Vogel said when he actually announced Lambda. This is the undifferentiated heavy lifting. This is the stuff. Serverless is solving all of those things that are not adding value to our business. They're, they're taking away from, from our work in terms of our contribution um, to the bottom line. So I've done a couple talks in Coke and in, uh, in other places. And I talk about this. I get really excited about, I'm, I'm a geek, and I get really excited about all of the, um, the serverless stuff. And one of the things I notice is, you know, I talk to audience, I get a lot, lot of blank stares, especially inside of our company. And, and what I realized, it confused me first, but what I realized is that whenever you're talking about significant technological change, uh, it scares people. And, and people are going to worry about their contribution and their job and how, is it, how it affects them. So, so we've, we've resolved to pair every conversation about technology with a conversation about people and how it affects people. So I, I don't think that serverless is one of those technologies that's just going to lay waste the headcount in your organization. I think this is going to empower people. And this is going to get us out of the muck work. We're spending so much time, like nuts and bolts security, like us dealing with patching on our servers and scaling and managing all that stuff, that does not help us sell refreshments. right? But, but that's the bulk of, of a lot of the work that we're doing. And so, um, so yeah, when you talk about this with people, I think you should always have a, um, have a discussion about, the, um, about their futures and what this means and how, how it actually changes the, the, the work that you're doing. So, uh, these are a lot of the services. Um, a lot of people talk about Lambda and serverless, but, but basically for almost, for, for a lot of the workloads that we're doing, um, message queues, APIs, NAT boxes, RDS, you could argue whether it's serverless, but I, f I feel like it deserves um, a place there. Amazon um, uh, DynamoDB. Um, I, hope that, um, I hope that you can take this back to your organizations and, and position this and um, move forward with serverless next year. And uh, so next up is uh, Andrew Baird is going to talk about uh, best practices for the enterprise. Hey, everybody. Um, again, my name is Andrew Baird. I'm a solutions architect with AWS that works with large enterprises like Coca-Cola based in Atlanta. Um, and I'm here to talk to you specifically about um, some more generic best practices that I've seen large companies be successful with when they're trying to adopt um, you know, a large strategic push for serverless architectures. Um, and the, the thing to start with is that there's a real paradigm shift that's going to happen in a lot of different IT areas for your organization. And not just from a, you know, the things you, you hear about, about a you know, process and a culture change and a, and a true technology change, but a lot of the development practices and the way you're building your applications will, will inherently shift when you're trying to adopt serverless architecture. So I'm going to talk about um, how those things shift. And, and the things I'll mention will um, probably sound familiar if you're an organization that's uh, practicing DevOps or striving for DevOps. But um, the real difference is, is that there's a level of mandate for those things that comes with interacting with serverless architectures, where if you're running servers and practicing DevOps, um, it's, very, it's very easy to still manage server-based infrastructure and applications with the same you know, traditional methodologies and incrementally adopt some of these things, but uh, insulate a lot of your DevOps practices with old-school infrastructure mindsets and wrapping you know, security in the networking layer and, and security within your OS, and maybe the bar is still not that raised for um, your application posture and development processes. But when you're moving to serverless applications, because all of that infrastructure and the management of it is, is abstracted from you and owned by Amazon, uh, there'll be uh, a lot more onus and focus on your part in addressing these, these pillars within the application code itself and the architectures that you're building. Um, so let's, let's jump into to each one of them there. So security, it's job zero for AWS. 
Um, obviously, it's going to be job zero for a lot of the folks in the room here. Um, what changes for security? Good news is that because of so many different aspects of your architecture being offloaded to AWS, the threat surfaces that you're responsible for are going to get a lot more narrow. So a lot of that time that, that Connor mentioned is being spent today on you know, making sure that an entire you know, full file system with ambiguous software running on top of it is being protected with things like IDS and IPS and patching and all of those things. The time you're spending there can be refocused and, and placed upon the, the, the aspects of your security threat services that are still within your responsibility. Um, so I'm going to talk about each of the ones that's, that's highlighted here that's still um, your responsibility to, to address within a serverless architecture. Um, so the AWS APIs, even if you're running server-based applications or running workloads on us today, you've been thinking about this already, using things like AWS SIG v4, uh, using things like IAM and IAM roles. Um, th those, those best practices for the bulk of your architecture aren't going to change when your architecture is serverless, but the introduction of AWS Lambda being the heart of your application logic is, is, a, is a pretty differentiating thing that's, that's transformational for the way that you've got to think about security, because now you've got uh, an AWS API, uh, that represents how your literal application code is going to be inserted into a service that we're managing for you. Um, so access to that, to that API is very similar to giving somebody root access to an OS, allowing them to configure an application, decide what's going to run. Um, so protecting uh, access and, and really tight access control around all of the Lambda APIs associated with deployment, um, associated with specifically Lambda functions that represent your production applications, um, is something that needs a, a specific amount of focus for a large organization where you may have uh, you know, hundreds of Lambda functions eventually and many different applications. It's really important to, to create as much decoupling as you can between IAM roles and Lambda functions and policies so that as your growth into, into serverless uh, architectures evolves, that you've got you know, individual and segregated IAM policies and IAM roles that you can keep least privileges um, in alignment with, with your functions. There's a lot of, a lot of times I see uh, developers um, get started with Lambda and they build a full application stack that uses maybe five or six Lambda functions and a pretty consolidated single IAM policy um, that represents all of the permissions that each of those, function needs, uh, each of those functions need. And it creates a, a, a mechanism where now you've got five different functions that aren't operating at least, least privilege. Um, so definitely a recommendation to, to have a single one-to-one uh, -one relationship between all of, your, all of your IAM roles, your policies, and your Lambda functions. Um, uh, for any of the APIs that you're going to stand up that sit in front of your Lambda functions, um, again, because I'll talk a little bit uh, in the future, in a, in a future slide about uh, networking a little more, but um, the APIs you create are going to be able to be uh, secured with AWS SIG v4 um, request signing. Um, it's, a, it's an area that because you may have APIs that are public facing with untrusted networks, um, that you've got to implement your own security model differently than if you were deploying a server within a, you know, a private VPC environment. Um, and because all of these things are you know, abstracted from you and the deployment process is um, about inserting your application into you know, AWS Lambda through our APIs, and you're going to tightly control who has access to those, and ideally in production it should be nobody that has access to them, the new focal point for um, where humans have access and tight access control becomes your CICD pipelines. So it's really important to think through um, a very thorough strategy around your source code repositories, um, how you're getting your, your release branches in your repositories automatically deployed up into your shared environments. Um, so tight access control around who's got access to which repositories, um, what type of uh, programmatic validation you're doing against the code that's checked in. Um, and a, a way that we've seen that adopt, uh, be adopted more you know, practically within a large organization is to think pretty strategically about the tools that you want to use up front um, and, and enable all of your teams to you know, set security policies internally that apply with specific tools in mind so that when you, you, know, you want to enforce access control or encryption, um, you know, the way you're managing keys and how they're ingested into your source code, um, once you're sharing tools and give ways for your developers to share best practices, um, it creates a, an environment that you know, has a lot less complexity for you to manage organizationally in your processes than to let you know, different development teams uh, choose their own tool sets where it's, it's hard to map your policies internally to what the best practices for, for meeting those policies with a, a wide variety of tools. So um, consolidating and standardizing on tool sets is something I really recommend up front. Um, uh, other than the deployment mechanics and how you're getting your applications into AWS Lambda, the, the real focal point um, for you know, the, the, the most emphasis on your security model is now going to be your application code itself. 
Um, so some of the practices that we, we have here at Amazon prior to my role as a solutions architect, I spent time as a developer with Amazon on the dot-com side. Um, we have mandatory code reviews and, and an audit trail in the commits that, that uh, you know, mention who reviewed your code. Um, even if you don't practice you know, pair programming, the code review process becomes really, really important. Um, giving any, any developer access to check in code to a release branch um, that's going to be automatically funneled into a shared environment that's got you know, access to um, your, your databases and you know, potentially sensitive data. Um, it's important to, to mandate some, some policy around um, uh, how the code gets checked in and the audit trail around you know, making sure that the code that was checked in was um, you know, thoughtfully checked in and reviewed by multiple members of the team. Um, one of the, one of the themes that you hear, hear throughout the, the recommendations I'm providing um, is going to be a lot of automation and programmatic you know, capabilities. So um, things to do static code analysis, um, code test coverage enforcement, um, all of those things you can layer on top of your source code that maybe you haven't worried too much about in a traditional model because a lot of the security posture was uh, you know, wrapped around your application packages um, through things that were you know, sitting on top of the OS, agents that were um, performing IDS, IPS, and antivirus. Um, but without those things in AWS Lambda, um, it's important for you to implement, you know, a, a, implement good visibility into your source code and make sure that the code that's being checked in is you know, self-sufficient and meeting its own security bars. Um, so wrapping all of that in automation is a good way to do it. Um, so networking, enterprise networking is a topic that's it's hard, right? Um, if you're a large organization that especially has been involved in any M&A activity, um, you might have an enterprise network that looks something like this, um, where you've had to bolt together a lot of different pieces, a lot of different businesses. Um, firewall changes are very risky. The, the infrastructure teams don't have a ton of good knowledge about what applications integrate with other applications. Um, and it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a really hard problem to solve. And one of the reasons it's so hard is because um, they need to enforce this idea of trusted networks, right? If, if applications haven't been, uh, haven't been being held to a, to a high bar for um, enforcing their own security posture, um, the network is often relied upon a lot to make sure that applications are communicating privately. Um, maybe you've got sensitive applications that haven't been using HTTPS because they're um, uh, running in a private network in your data center and just using HTTP. So trusted networks have been a really important thing. Um, for, for enterprises to ensure you know, still exist and it's a hard problem to, to solve. Um, so good news with when you're networking with Lambda, or thinking about your networks with Lambda, is that they're service oriented by default. Um, all of the, the ways in which you interact with Lambda, whether it be events that are you know, based on uh, events coming from S3 or SNS or Alexa, the code that you're, the code that you're writing uh, in your Lambda function is going to inherently feel like um, a, server, a, a, a web service based application. Um, so all of the, the web service best practices you're, you're already aware of and probably practicing for your most sensitive applications will still apply um, to the way that you're, you're writing code inside of Lambda. So uh, enforcing identities with things like OAuth. Um, I mentioned AWS SIG v4 for request signing. Uh, enforcing HTTPS is constantly used throughout um, because the, uh, the real rule here is that because you're deploying Lambda functions typically in our default networking environment where they all have access to the internet, um, you're going to implement your network-based security in the applications themselves through um, things like identity authorization and, and encryption over um, HTTPS, things like that. Okay? Um, so high availability and disaster recovery. High availability is a really easy topic. If you're using the default networking environment, Lambda gives you high availability and multi-AZ for free. Um, if you're running Lambda functions inside a VPC, uh, you've got to deploy them to multiple subnets and configure that VPC to make sure you get your, your high availability. Um, but it's a really easy topic to cover. Um, disaster recovery in large organizations traditionally has had some type of geographic distance component to it. Um, so a lot of times in AWS that means running in multiple regions. Uh, a lot of the, the applications that folks are building uh, with AWS Lambda um, are inherently net new. So I really challenge the folks in the room um, to rethink the way that you often approach DR. A lot of times I see um, development processes um, that you know, architect an application, assume it's kind of a, a single, you know, single thread stack application that has a you know, three-tier web app with a web server, an app server, and a database. Uh, and then when DR is introduced, you figure out how, to, how, to, how are you going to mirror that architecture in a separate environment um, if a disaster occurs. But because these are net new applications where you can start fresh, we have a ton of service capabilities and all of these serverless services um, that make multi-region global deployments in an, in an active, active context 
um, you know, much more differently achievable than, than simply taking you know, storage replication and migrating server images and deploying mirrored architectures. So look, take a look at things like DynamoDB streams as a way that you can uh, replicate your data to other regions. Take a look at S3 cross-region replication um, and think about uh, a way in which if you need to have multi-region um, uh, a multi-region footprint, if that's the, you know, the type of mission critical workload you're running, um, think about the way you're going to architect it up front and how data is going to migrate between regions, how you're going to keep those regions in sync, um, how you're going to perform deployments to multiple regions. Um, it's a really important topic to think through up front when you're going with this model because it's, a, it's an inherently different looking solution than simply copying servers from one region to another. Okay? Uh, speaking of deployment, um, deployment is a really interesting topic with serverless and it's going gonna, it's gonna, to you know, be dictated by what your application is and the way that the architecture looks. There's a lot of different deployment strategies when it comes to Lambda. Um, the, the couple different mechanisms that you integrate with, with Lambda from, from the event perspective are typically either through an API and a request response where there's a client um, that's, that's blocked waiting for your Lambda function to execute. And for scenarios like that, um, there's some strategies around blue-green deployments and pre-warming where you can uh, introduce into your deployment pipeline um, some other mechanism, whether it be another Lambda function, um, some scripting that exists that uh, after the new Lambda function has been deployed to invoke that function before you've released it to, to the live environment to make sure all of the Lambda functions that you need to be living in parallel have been scaled out for you by the service before you cut live traffic over to it. Um, if you're running a, a serverless architecture that's more you know, asynchronous and event driven, a, a file landing S3, starting a, a data workflow that's, that's serverless and Lambda based, um, make sure you've thought about if you deploy bad code into your Lambda function, uh, what's going to happen when you, you know, the code that you've wrote uh, hasn't performed the way you expect, you need to roll your code back, how are you going to reprocess the events that have already occurred? Um, so think about the, the, the other aspects you're going to have to build into the architecture to take advantage of, of um, or to take into account rather, um, those failure modes and, and what it's going to mean for uh, performing a rollback for your application if you deploy bad code. Um, Lambda aliases are going to be really at the heart of a lot of those strategies. So Lambda aliases, for those not familiar, are the way in which while you're versioning your Lambda functions from, so the example I have here from version you know, 19 to 20, so to speak, uh, alias is a, a mechanism to let you decouple uh, what your, which version your clients are integrating with. So um, for example, I might have a, a Lambda alias called live that represents my live production traffic. It's pointing at version 19. Uh, I might realize that there's you know, some type of issue that I want to further debug. I flip a debug flag in my code and deploy that as version 20. All of my live traffic is still running through version 19, um, but I can have my debug software, my debug stack, pointing at the, the debug alias, which is pointing at alias uh, version number 20. Um, so a lot of interesting strategies you can take into account when you, when you really understand the way you want to use aliases. So look pretty deeply at the way that your organization uh, it's testing practices, your operational strategies, and, and how you're going to use Lambda aliases to, to, to meet the bar that you have. Um, and the last recommendation we're going to give here is just the idea of having a, a separate environment, uh, meaning QA, test, production, uh, is a separate function in AWS Lambda. So um, there's a couple different, and, and I'll leave it open, all the recommendations I'm giving, it's not to say that um, you, you have to take them as the Bible, but um, for... Uh, separate environments and separate functions. One thing to keep in mind that a lot of large organizations already do is they create separate accounts and separate VPCs as a way to limit blast radius when things go wrong. Um, and creating separate functions for your environments is just another way that you can make sure that the blast radius around you know, activities going awry in your development stack, um, your deployment pipeline, uh, developers that have access to things you didn't think they had access to, um, creating separate functions and policies, IAM policies and roles, that are function specific creates another level of blast radius um, around your Lambda environments and your Lambda-based Lambda applications. So um, I, I, I encourage everybody to think about creating a, a production Lambda function that's fully isolated from the rest of your functions in that same application environment. Okay. Um, now, because I recommend all this decoupling and proliferation potentially of the number of functions you have to manage, you might be thinking I would hate to manage you know, hundreds of functions for you know, a couple dozen apps. Um, so one of the things that we've just recently introduced is the AWS serverless application model, um, which really spends, um, or, or provides a lot of capability around consolidating um, your application stack definitions into a single auditable place, um, this, this YAML file. Uh, that translates into a CloudFormation template where you can represent your full application stacks uh, in that single place. 
um, to really ease the management of, you know, when you look at an AWS account and there's potentially hundreds of Lambda functions, remembering which API gateway APIs they're supposed to be tied to, remembering which DynamoDB tables are associated with each function, um, it, can become a, it can become a management nightmare unless you use something like the serverless application model um, as your mechanism for you know, keeping track of, of, of all of those relationships between the, the different services you're using. Um, and uh, the other, the, the last thing that I want to leave related to deployments is um, rather than thinking kind of uh, in the server base where a lot of times the, the source of truth for what was running on a particular server, which version, was literally the code package that was installed on your um, installed on your server. If you wanted to debug it, you'd look and see, you know, which version of your software was installed on your server. Um, because you don't have a ton of visibility to, you don't have a box to log into anymore and take a look at. Um, you know, what's running, I really recommend you treating your source code repositories and the entry point for your CI CD pipelines as a real source of truth representation of what's been deployed. So if anything gets checked into um, a release branch that enters into your, you know, your development pipeline, you should be able to one-to-one -one directly translate those commit times in your, in your uh, source repository with the deployments that have occurred inside your Lambda environment. And if you're able to do that, if you're able to see, OK, this is a Lambda function deployment that occurred to version 20, uh, and it happened at this time based on the, the APIs we provide, and you can go back and look inside your source code repository and see which package that correlates to, it'll make your operational triages a lot, a lot simpler. Um, so really recommend that. And uh, speaking of operations, I've kind of alluded to the, to the aspect that you don't have a server to log into anymore to triage things. Um, so what that really means is, rather than having immutable infrastructure, which a lot of people have been striving for with their servers, you have strictly untouchable infrastructure from your perspective. So everything you need to do from an operational perspective has to be fully baked into um, all of your application code. So alarms, logs, test cases, all the aliases, metrics you want to gather, all of those things need to be baked into your code itself. Uh, and and uh, failure to, to bake these things into your, to, into your code up front uh, when an operational issue comes, comes uh, forward and there's something you need to investigate. Um, if you haven't spent the time you know, baking the right log statements, error handling, uh, metrics gathering into your code up front, you're going to have no visibility into it. So you've got to build all of your operational visibility into your Lambda function code itself. Okay? Overall summary, I won't read through all of this, but um, the main message is that all of this is application and development centric. Um, the only way you're going to you know, achieve best practices as a large organization is to put some real thought into um, each one of these five pillars uh, and how they're going to you know, be impacted from your traditional you know, processes and technology choices when moving to serverless um, and to, to fully embrace um, you know, all the automation that you can, all the continuous deployment capabilities that you can. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to, uh, to Patrick here, who's going to um, dive deep into specifically how Coca-Cola adopted a strategy. Thank you, Andrew. Am I good? Too loud? All right. Um, uh, yep, yeah, so I'm Patrick Brand. I'm a solutions architect at Coca-Cola. Uh, I, uh, I own the, the North American consumer marketing platform. Um, and our story with, of serverless adoption really began with what Connor was talking about earlier uh, with a, a few very high value but narrowly scoped services um, that we built from the ground up in a, a, you know, using serverless technologies. And so that's, that's the most important thing is to get something in the wild. It gave us an opportunity to know how to build things and manage things in a serverless context. And then obviously we got real data to, to do the cost comparison. Uh, so the next step for us is to figure out how to create a model that we can scale. All right, because we work with hundreds of development partners and vendors. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, there's a lot of initiatives that we're managing at any given time. So before I talk about what we're doing now and when, in serverless and where we're going, I want to talk about where we are. Um, we have a, a reference architecture that's worked very well for us for the last few years. It's uh, predicated on Elastic Beanstalk. Um, you can see that there's, uh, you know, there, there's, there's NAT and RDS and, and whatever. But the most important thing I want to talk about here is how the development teams interface with their application. You can see that they go through Bastion, they have direct access to the servers and the RDS, they can shell in there and, and do all kinds of stuff if they want to. Um, but they, uh, but they, also, uh, they also interface through the portal, through the Elastic Beanstalk console. And typically that's how code gets deployed. You know, I mean, there's an opportunity, you know, for some CI, CD um, uh, work here, but there's, there's no real uh, mandate, right? 
So for our first generation reference architecture for serverless, which we're, we're using to focus exclusively on APIs and data services, the most important thing I want to point out here is, is the way we're now making DevOps a central piece of not just, you know, it's not just about adopting serverless for, you know, cost savings, et cetera. It's about adopting DevOps and serverless together to really, really allow us to rapidly deploy applications with high value consistently, safely, audit, you know, with audits and security built in. And then later on, uh, sometime next year, we're going to uh, fold in the, the presentation tier, so the front end. Um, you know, this is in the serverless context. We're talking about static website hosting in S3. Uh, we're gonna, we've chosen three thick stack clients, JavaScript clients, Angular, uh, Polymer, and React. And obviously this is gonna extend our pipeline and, and our operational overhead considerably, but um, it will still follow the DevOps model. So our timeline is this, right? We're starting here, Gen 1. Uh, we've been doing some work over the last few weeks, um, which I'll share with you shortly, uh, to create some assets that we want to socialize with, with the world, really, but um, with our development teams, possibly with uh, the merchants and retailers who sell our products. It's a value add to us for, from a business perspective as well. But the workhorse, Gen Zero, isn't going away. I mean, there will always be an opportunity for instances, especially um, you know, when we, we, we have a, a server license. You know, we do a lot of work with Magento and Adobe CQ. Good news is it's a very mature platform, has a lot of built-in operational support. It's been around for years. Um, so we're, uh, we won't have any trouble having those two things live side by side. All right, so there are four key ingredients to our, what I call our development scaffolding, right? These are the things that, are, that will enable developers to um, deploy, uh, build, deploy, create serverless applications in, in as short amount of time as possible. Um, obviously, Amazon Web Services, can't live without it. Um, the, the, the other two things uh, are about the build um, and development. So the serverless framework, it's something that we've been working with for a few um, months now, I guess. You know, we deployed our first serverless application about three, week, uh, three months ago. And the Go uh, build server which is gonna support our CI CD pipelines. And we'll, we'll, we'll review an example of, of how this is working in the real world shortly. But when it comes to adoption, the most critical thing is to get as many eyeballs on you know, what we're working on, what we're um, delivering as possible. So GitHub is a big part of our story. And this is, is you know, we're, we're kind of doing a lot of things at once here. Um, you know, we, we've created a, a, an open source organization where we're going to share these assets. Um, and then you know, have a collaborative relationship, hopefully, with, with um, the development community. So let's start with the serverless framework. Um, the framework gives us a couple things. It gives us a single asset, a serverless YAML file, uh, where I can define my functions. I can bind them to API gateway endpoints. I can configure cross-origin policies. I can configure authorizers. A lot of really complex configuration distilled to, what's that, like eight lines or something? I mean, it's, it's fast, and it's very boilerplate-y, you know? Um, the, uh, the other thing I can do in here is not only do I, do I have this very clean syntax for defining you know, API Gateway and Lambda connections, I can define any other resource, like in just straight CloudFormation YAML. And we'll look at a, a, a file in more detail later. The other thing that I get with serverless is a CLI that will deploy these resources for me. Um, it can deploy the full service, everything I write up in YAML, in the serverless YAML, or it can do per function deployments. And that's really critical to support our um, continuous integration, continuous delivery model, which we're doing on a per function basis. So every single function gets its own uh, CI CD pipeline. They all go through unique individual stages that can be developed and deployed uh, independently. And this is kind of microservices, right? I mean, microservices, um, two key components are resource isolation, um, which you get out of the box with Lambda. You know, you can define for each function, you can define its, um, uh, its own resource needs. Um, but also uh, segregated deployment, segregated development. And that's where the CI CD pipeline makes a difference for us. And I'll show you some stuff later that um, we're really proud of, and it's kind of some DevOps magic that, uh, that I can't wait to, 
to toot our horn wrong. Anyway, so we have a, a few milestones for, for our CICD pipeline. We're starting with the, the basics, right? Um, automated unit testing, code coverage, and uh, automated deployments, and manual promotion through a test and production environment. And finally, how we're going to use GitHub. So we started uh, C0K3. Feel free to bring that up. We're going to look at it a little bit later. Um, we're, we're, we've just got a couple projects out there right now, but we're going we're to continue to build on it. Um, later on, we're going to use GitHub pages to become a knowledge base. You know, and this is going to be very well designed, very good you know, graphic design, information design, all things we like to do as a, the best brand company in the world. Um, we're going we're gonna to reflect that in our, in our knowledge base. So one thing, a couple things, to talk about um, the detail to not be uh, overlooked. So we have an existing relationship with a managed services partner, Second Watch. Um, they, do, they do a lot of good things for us. They do um, IT governance. They do cost controls. But day to day, they're also doing a lot of baseline infrastructure support, right? And this is, this is what Connor and Andrew were talking about. Um, you know, OS patches, Elastic Beanstalk, platform upgrades when that happens. So their mandate is now to move up the stack, right? There's, you know, forget about, there is no server to patch. So we're gonna, um, we're gonna work with them to do much more sophisticated application support. The build pipeline, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we have a lot of, you know, we're, we're gonna evolve that. Uh, we wanna do automated uh, performance testing, you know, security scanning and static analysis, automated integration testing, a lot of good stuff um, and a lot of good work. Uh, and then add advanced application monitoring which is where Splunk comes into the picture. And Splunk is a key ingredient to, to our existing platform. Uh, you know, we've got between 500 to 800 instances, you know, give or take the day. And, um, and uh, each one of them has a, uh, an agent running on them, a universal forwarder that sends uh, events off to Splunk. And you know, we, um, we, uh, the agencies have access to this so they can create you know, dashboards and they can you know, kind of customize their own, to their own needs. Alerting, you know, when things go wrong, that all happens through Splunk. Without an agent, we need to send the stuff through CloudWatch logs first, right? So CloudWatch logs will capture anything I log in my Lambda functions. It'll capture any event generated by API Gateway, you know, ingress, egress stuff. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, we're, we're, there's a Splunk add-on for AWS that then allows us to scoop that up and get it into the, the tool we love so much. But back to DevOps and making sure DevOps touches everything, we're also going to start capturing build events, right? So if there's a build failure, if there's an integration test or performance test, the latency goes up, whatever, for any application in our platform, it will show up in Splunk. So we're going to have very, very deep intelligence. At any given time, what, what, are, you know, what's, what's the health of our, of our platform? You know? How are these 100, 500, however many applications we're hosting and services we're hosting, how are they doing overall? All right, so look at some code. Let's look at some code. Um, give me a minute to log in. All right, I'll try not to mess this up. Oh, I said I wasn't gonna mess that up. <laughs> there we go, yes. Um, okay, so this is the, uh, a sample application that we've built. Um, I unfortunately don't have time to go into uh, a lot of details. We, you know, it's still a work in progress, but um, there's a lot, of, a lot of good stuff here in the README. I want to focus on two key pieces. You know, we talked about um, the serverless YAML file being the representation of all the resources that makes my application go. There's another file, a single file, that also defines my CICD pipeline, everything in my pipeline. So we're talking about two files, and I love that. That's simple, right? Um, if I only have to manage two things in my repository to get a full end-to-end -end application and CI CD pipeline, I'm in pretty good shape. That's very portable. Um, so let's go into it just for, uh, just for a bit. OK, so I'll do the quick walkthrough. You saw this a little bit in the slide, but um, again, it's, uh, I've got uh, eight API endpoints or something like that. You know, I define the handler for my Lambda function, the code's in the repository. This HTTP event is actually an API gateway endpoint. What's my resource? What's my verb? You know, I've got kind of a placeholder for cross-origin there. 
And then, you know, uh, defining what, I have a couple of different custom authorizers, defining which authorizer gets executed, what the time to live for that authorizer is, how long it gets cached, what's the uh, request header, all customizable. And all that's doing is it's pointing to yet another Lambda function down here, right? So everything is very consistent in the way it's designed. Um, and then, as I had said earlier, I can also define any other resource I want. Uh, I've got a couple of DynamoDB tables here. Uh, this particular, I should have mentioned, this particular API example, um, it, it's, it, does, uh, it manages user sessions with uh, OAuth tokens, JSON web tokens. So I have a user table to store basic you know, identity data, and then a token table to, um, to manage the session. If we go up to the top, there's a few more things I want to cover. Um, so I can, uh, I can express the uh, execution role for the entire service. Um, in this case, every single Lambda function is going to be able to access DynamoDB. There's some stuff in here for uh, running uh, requests out through a uh, NAT gateway. I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, it, we're, we're able to take advantage of the latest and greatest you know, Lambda features, environment variables. Right there, that environment uh, setting will actually set an environment variable in Lambda. You can go look at it in the console. Um, and then here, you know, this is, this is how I uh, bind my functions to VPC. Uh, for the record, uh, I'm working on a way to not hard code this stuff, but anyway, give me a minute. Um, okay, so uh, th oh, also though, I wanted to mention, you know, get back to something Andrew said. I can define IAM execution roles policies per Lambda function. So each one of these guys can have its own IAM statement, right? And that gets back to that isolation that, uh, that um, Andrew mentioned earlier. Okay. Let us look at the uh, pipelines file. So there, there's a lot here. I mean, uh, this is heavily marked up. It's meant to be a, a learning resource as well. But, um, you know, it's uh, in here, there, there are my pipeline stages, you know, the things that, that I run um, the, each function through. But ultimately, that ends up looking like this, you know. So that YAML file builds this interface for me, and it gives me the operational logic to, uh, you know, on, on commit, on push, to recognize that, and then, you know, for whatever function changed, to run its pipeline. What's really great about this, and I really like, this is this DevOps magic that I'm so excited about. If I change that pipeline's go YAML file, and I commit it, my build server updates automatically, right? I don't touch my build server. I just change stuff in the code, and I have a brand new pipeline. So if I need, if I add a function, let's say delete user, um, for me to get a new pipeline up is copy and paste, a little bit of boilerplate, tweak a few things, commit push, and it shows up. And now I have a per function pipeline. Uh, a couple of other things, I'll just, I'll go through really quickly. Um, I've got a job that will, that will create the whole VPC stack. It's got uh, this particular job will create public private subnets and two availability zones with um, uh, manage NAT. So I click a button, it's there. And then I just, I have like the full service monolithic deploy, you know, job. Um, just if, you know, if I want to blow everything away. Uh, in that YAML file, you know, it's, it is a little hard to tell unless you spend a little time with it, but I define each one of these eight stages. So when code changes, for a function, just a function. So let's say I'm looking at what create session here. So I change my create session function. I commit the code, I push it. It will automatically unit test, lint, do static analysis, perform code coverage, automate deploy to dev, and then stage for test and then wait. And you can see this in some earlier builds. I didn't go all the way through. I even have a failure there. I don't know what happened. Anyway, um, at, 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 at that point it's stage for test. I can now manually go and deploy to test, stage for prod, manually deploy to prod. And again, all of this is managed in a single file that, uh, that will drive the functioning of my build server in addition to the definition of my build server. All right. So those were the two things I wanted to cover. I also snuck in some VPC stuff. Okay, good. All right, so where does that take us? Um, 
because the application is the infrastructure now, because my code repository defines everything, uh, what my code is, what it lives on, how it gets deployed, the quality control stages that it runs through, there's, there's going to be a significant change from the way we're working, right? And the way we're working really means, or the, you know, the, the change is primarily centered around the development teams. Development teams have a lot of power, you know, and they have a lot of ownership. Um, you know, there's some operational stuff, again, working with Second Watch that we're going to figure out as we scale that out to uh, thousands of people. Um, but ultimately, that's going to be the principle that we're going to adhere to. And serverless is more, right? So, uh, you know, less complexity is more quality. Less time installing and configuring servers is more time that my application is in market. Critical time, very important time. Uh, and, you know, less time managing servers is more time that I can code and do stuff I like to do. So uh, we see this marriage of DevOps and serverless really as a movement, you know? I mean, it's just starting. It's, it's cool, it's exciting to be on the, the cusp of something which I think is so revolutionary. Um, and we're doing our part, you know, to, 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 to not only to adopt that, but to advance it, to advocate for it. Um, and our, our, GitHub, uh, our GitHub space is, is really the primary driver for that. So we want to share, you know, we're sharing the things we're building with, with you and with the development community. Obviously, um, if you like it, feel free to use it. If you want to change it, do a pull request. We'd be happy to help you. Um, so this is this is our opportunity to uh, to kind of to, you know again to collaborate and to um, to really for our own benefit, but also for the benefit of the community at large. So we're really excited to engage in that. Hope you are too. All right. So. So thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Um, hope you enjoyed the talk.